In addition to those who've lost limbs, thousands of service members are dealing with other serious war injuries. I have short-term memory loss, complex memory loss, so sometimes somebody will ask me a question and my mind will totally blank and I can't think of it. On an MP patrol, specialist Shelley Daniels Humvee was hit by a rocket-propelled grenade. Flying metal ripped out her collarbone. She suffered head trauma and almost bled to death. She praises the quick response of her fellow MPs and the treatment at Walter Reed. The doctors here, they deal with a lot more trauma and um, a lot more different injuries than a normal hospital would actually take care of because of all the wounded that have come back. The biggest problem with the recovery and what we got, you know, what all of us have to go through is the, the frustration. Petty Officer Joseph Worley's wife and daughter are on hand to help ease the setbacks and psychological difficulties of recovery. He's in his seventh month at Walter Reed. A Navy medical corpsman assigned to a Marine unit in strife-torn Fallujah, he had to apply a tourniquet to his own severed left leg after an IED explosion. His right leg was shattered. His recovery is also being helped by the positive attitude of so many of his fellow patients. Just about everyone who, who is an amputee or is injured and down here has an absolutely awesome attitude. Everyone takes it really well. Strangely enough, you think, you know, some at least a couple of guys would be pretty angry and salty about it, but no, everyone, you know, everyone's awesome about it. When recon continues, a school for medics that's helping bring more wounded soldiers back from the battlefield alive. Five second rush to the first cone out there. You see that cone out Sergeant there? First Class Niles Arrington is briefing young medics of the 101st Airborne Division, telling them what will happen on validation day. Your patient is right on the board. Yes, you will have a live patient. The patient is unconscious. You will not help anybody. They're at the end of a specialized advanced training course for medics developed here at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. First up, an obstacle course. I'll be pretty wore out by the time it's done. It looks, especially that hill, <laughs> looks pretty hard, but you got to do what you got to do. Well, with all his gear on, he weighs about 220, and I don't, so it's going to be tough. I can do it, though. Get out, get out, get out! The course is called Tactical Combat Casualty Care. It teaches the Army's new approach to caring for casualties on the battlefield. Clearly in the civilian world you don't have a lot of traumatic amputations from IEDs or VDIEDs or gunshot wound. It, you don't have those kind of high velocity projectiles. You don't have the degree of damage that we're talking about. So we, uh, we want to change the paradigm of how we think and how we manage combat trauma. Here we teach the best medicine on the battlefield is fire superiority. If you're under fire, suppress the enemy. One medic on his weapon can turn the tide in a small unit engagement. While under fire, the patient would not be actually receiving a whole lot of medical treatment at that time. Nothing more than maybe a tourniquet to stop the bleeding and continue firing. Okay, that's your number one mission. Or possibly just opening an airway with a head tilt, chin lift, something simple as that. The final evaluation is meant to simulate battlefield conditions. The last stage of the obstacle course, transporting a fellow student up a hill on a portable stretcher called a Skedco. It's meant to be strenuous. You're heavy, dude. Sergeant Jeffrey Imel is one of the few trainees in this class who has already deployed once to Iraq. In real combat, you are tired, you're smoked, you've been, you've been you know, fighting for a good hour, 30 minutes. I mean, f after five minutes of fighting, you're tired. And then that's when, as a medic, that's when you start your job. That's when you start tr treating your patients, triaging your patients, and getting your patients back to a uh, medical treatment facility. The instructors have all been deployed to combat zones. They bring both institutional lessons learned and personal knowledge to the classroom. One core teaching message, CBA, check circulation first, then attend to breathing and airways. My experience 
stopping that bleeding first. Many tourniquets, I've put many tourniquets on. Airway, I've done needle decompressions. I've done endotracheal tubes on patients. I know you see major bleeding. That's the first thing you need to take care of if they're screaming they have an airway. The last stage of the trainee's evaluation, the darkened battle room. Firefight sounds pound, strobe lights flash. The room is littered with vehicle parts and three dummies. Two have a mechanically simulated pulse, the other has none and is supposed to be dead. All are rigged with typical battlefield injuries. The trainees have to diagnose all this in the dark. What we teach them is their hands are their eyes and they will have to rely almost at least 95% on their hands to find these wounds and treat these patients. They are allowed to have a red, green, or blue pin light or chem light. Not all students uh, complete the task successfully, but this is the place to fail because you can continue to learn here because we don't want them to fail out in real life in the battlefield. He was dead. You wasted your time and your equipment on a dead guy. Hey, everybody! After operations in Somalia in the early 1990s, military physicians embarked on an intensive historical review of battlefield injuries. They concluded that about half the battlefield deaths were due to bleeding and that 20% of those could have been prevented by medics with the right equipment and modified training. Even in Vietnam, where helicopters first made rapid evacuation of the wounded possible, the death rate remained high. Looking to change that, military caregivers modified their approach. The significant advancements I really think has been the emphasis on hemorrhage control. Uh, that is the place where if you get to that soldier, sailor, airman who's, who's injured and who's down and you can stop the bleeding, then you can save that guy's life. Colonel Holcomb led development of something called the Fibron Bandage. It uses chemicals already in the human body to stop severe hemorrhaging. So far, it is only approved for experimental use. When it comes in contact with blood, it immediately forms a extremely strong, but really a, a natural superclot and at the site of the injury. Researchers here also helped develop the Kaidosan bandage, made out of materials found in the shells of shrimp. It is being issued to Army medics now. The real way it stops bleeding is that this, once this surface becomes wet, especially in contact with blood, it sticks very well. So it's, uh, there is a component of absorbing blood, but it does, it's not uh, a mechanism where the dressing dissolves and turns into a clot, for example. Mm. This is, this is just sticks very well and seals. Then there's the new combat application tourniquet or CAT. It's now being issued to army medics and deployed soldiers. The doctrine has been changed, uh, making tourniquets now the first line of um, treatment for extremity injury. Uh, we understand now that tourniquets aren't nearly as damaging as once thought. The CAT is easy to use. You simply put it on your arm. Pull it tight, turn the windlass until blood flow stops, then goes into this cradle, and there you have it. Back at Fort Campbell, Private First Class Mandy Gardner strains to drag her 200 plus pound patient up the hill. So far, all the medics who have finished the evaluation failed in the battle room. Their simulated patients died of their wounds, earning those medics an LDOW on their score charts. The acronym signifies one extra task they have to perform, writing a letter of consolation. It's the first time any of them have had to write a letter notifying a family of the loss of a loved one, and it's not easy. And the heat of combat.